Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, strong reactions to President Biden's plan to forgive some student loans. Critics are blasting the expensive plan while supporters are grateful. It's not life changing and it's not world changing, but I'll take it. Of all the dumb things Joe Biden has done, this may be the dumbest yet. And we'll hear why court challenges are expected. Israel's prime minister warning the U.S. and other countries not to enter into a new nuclear deal with Iran. On the table right now is a bad deal. It would give Iran $100 billion a year. We'll hear about what Iran could do with that money and the possibility Israel could attack Iran. From our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell, as gender medical treatment for children has grown rapidly in the U.S., parents and professionals have been pushing back saying children don't understand the long-term effects. They certainly can't consent to losing their fertility and their sexual function at an age when they haven't even experienced anything about that. How can they have a conception of that? We'll hear about the concerns some doctors have as well. And it's a sign of the times. Imagine a state with a digital identity program that could track what you do. It could be on its way in Europe. Critics say it could lead to a dictatorship. They control everything and they, they, they watch everything. This is the example of a tyranny. And why some warn Christians could be targeted by such a system. All those stories and more today on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin this half hour with the fallout from President Biden's announcement on college student loan debt forgiveness. Supporters praise the move, with some wanting the president to go even further. But critics say the expensive plan is simply transferring the cost from students who borrow the money to taxpayers and arguing the White House is just buying votes before the upcoming midterm elections. George Thomas has our report. Tai Kiatatikom, who studies law at Ohio State University, is among millions of borrowers who will benefit from the loan forgiveness program. It's not life changing and it's not world changing, but I'll take it. Under the president's plan, the government will cancel $10,000 for borrowers making less than $125,000 a year and $20,000 for those who received Pell Grants. All this means people can start, finally crawl out from under that mountain of debt to get on top of their rent and their utilities, to finally think about buying a home or starting a family or starting a business. Kia Tatikom, who will be over $100,000 in debt by the time he graduates, says he'll take whatever help he can. I mean, 10K off, it's not changing anything dramatically about my life situation, but it's going to be, it, it represents another extra month maybe a year, however long of, of freedom that I get to enjoy, financial freedom that I get to enjoy post-graduation. Critics of the president's plan came out swinging. Of all the dumb things Joe Biden has done, this may be the dumbest yet. Tom Cotton of Arkansas calling it a bailout, paid for by the American taxpayer. Just think about how unfair this is for all the Americans who are harmed by this, who are now on the hook for hundreds of billions of dollars of other people's loans. Jason Furman, former top economist for President Barack Obama, tweeting pouring roughly half trillion dollars of gasoline on the inflationary fire that is already burning is reckless. And then there's the cost of the plan. How are we going to effectively pay for this? I, I think in terms of the inflation where we're at now, it is only likely to increase. One nonpartisan group predicts the president's plan could cost American taxpayers $500 billion over the next 10 years. And because he used executive action rather than legislation, legal challenges to his loan forgiveness plan are expected. George Thomas, CBN News. Turning now overseas to the Middle East, Israel and Arab countries are bracing for world powers to enter a new version of the 2015 Iranian nuclear deal. As CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports, some fear the negative impact it's likely to have on the Middle East and beyond. Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid is still urging the U.S. and other nations to stay away from what he calls a bad deal. It would give Iran $100 billion a year. This money will not build schools or hospitals. This is $100 billion a year that will be used to undermine stability in the Middle East and spread terror around the globe. His remarks to foreign journalists came as both sides reported progress in the talks. 
in our eyes, it does not meet the standards set by President Biden himself, preventing Iran from becoming a nuclear state. Former Israeli ambassador to the UN, Danny Danon, calls it a shameful moment. When President Biden was elected, he said clearly that he will make sure that the new agreement will be stronger and longer. What we are seeing today is a weaker and shorter agreement that will actually allow Iran to continue with their nuclear ambitions. It will be dangerous for Israel and for the region. The U.S. and other world powers first signed a nuclear deal with Iran in 2015. Three years later, then-President Trump withdrew. Since then, Iran has openly broken the terms. Sixteen months ago, the EU began trying to revive the agreement. They want to sign the agreement and to say we finished with that. But that's not the case. That's why together with our allies in the region, we will have to stand strong against Iran and prepare ourselves for every option. Reserve Brigadier General Yossi Kupavasser says Russia, China and Iran would benefit from such an agreement. From a global point of view, this is a very dangerous uh, development because it means that all the three main powers that want to change the global order are making progress in their efforts because they understand that there is an American weakness. Danone feels a deal would put Israel in a challenging position and believes the U.S. is taking advantage of Israel's political situation. With upcoming elections and what Danone calls an inexperienced leader, he believes the next government would need to do three things. First is to isolate Iran. Second is to call for more sanctions. And third is to build our military capability. So if we will have to take care of this threat ourselves, we will have the means to do it. And Chris Mills joins us now so we can dig a little bit deeper into this. So, Chris, uh, Danny Danone says, despite political differences, Israel will be united when it comes to Iran, correct? That's correct. Uh, uh, one thing that does unify, uh, you know, most people in the, across the political spectrum is Iran. There's a lot of differences within uh, Israel and, and the political differences they have, but they all recognize that, uh, that Iran poses an existential threat against the Jewish state. Uh, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu, the opposition leader and former prime minister, said the other day, you know, a nuclear device doesn't distinguish between Jew or Arab or left or right. Uh, so that's one thing that really does unify uh, the, all of Israel right now. They recognize that uh, Iran, a nuclear Iran, poses an existential threat to the Jewish state. Let's talk about the sanctions relief and the reported billions that Iran would receive after this deal. Why does it have so many concerns? Well, it has so many concerns because they would get $100 billion immediately. Mm -hmm. And some project by 2020, by 2030, they would get as much as a trillion dollars. Now, that money, uh, like, uh, like Yair Lapid said, it's not going to hospitals. It's going to the proxies of Iran all over the region. That includes Hezbollah and Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, many of the Iranian-backed uh, uh, proxies, the militias in Syria and uh, in Iraq. And uh, what that does is going to fuel them, in addition to do Hamas, Islamic Jihad in Gaza and the West Bank, uh, this is where the money is going to go. It's going to spread Iran's uh, hegemony around the region. It's going to uh, pose a danger on all of uh, Israel's borders and to many of the uh, the allies that uh, that Israel has right now. So the, the, all that money is going to fuel uh, terror. And this is uh, something that, why the, the Mossad chief calls it a strategic disaster, and some people in Israel are calling this complete madness. Uh, the Abraham Accords are nearly two years old. What impact would uh, happen to them with a nuclear deal? What would happen in relation? Uh, it, it's going to have a huge impact on the Abraham Accords. Part of the Abraham Accords was the fact that both Israel and the Gulf states all saw Iran as a mortal enemy. Uh, we were there in the Gulf. We met with leaders in the Gulf just a couple of months ago, and uh, they were saying that their one leader said that the three main uh, enemies of the, his country was Iran, Iran, and Iran. They were, they were just 100 miles away across the Gulf, and uh, they were actually maybe the first targets of Iran, and Israel would be next. So mm -hmm. the Abraham Accords was built sort of on this premise. Mm -hmm. Now that they see Iran getting stronger, they're going to turn back to Iran, away from Israel. Uh, they see the U.S. is sort of betraying them. They're angry at the U.S. right now. And so it really, really could damage the Abraham Accords that have been a historic agreement and bringing had brought peace to the Middle East. Will this put more pressure uh, on Israel to attack Iran? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, 
Is, Israel says it's not bound by this agreement, it's not a party to this agreement, and right now they see that uh, they have to go it alone against Iran, and they, uh, they may have to uh, do all they can militarily to do that. And they say that uh, what Iran needs is a credible military threat. Right now, the U.S. may say that they won't, won't allow Iran to get a, a nuclear device, but they don't have that credible military threat. There's also, and uh, Ephraim uh, just had this, uh, something called the Begin Doctrine. Mm. Prime Minister uh, Menachem Begum, in, uh, back in 1981, bombed the nuclear reactor in Iraq. And he said they won't allow the, any of their end neighbors to get a weapon of mass destruction. And uh, that was in 1981. We'll see what Israel does right now in 2022 or 2023. All right, we're we'll keeping an eye on this. Thank you so much, Chris Mitchell. Always appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Coming up, the debate over gender medicine for children reached a possible new point this week as the American Academy of Pediatrics may be putting the brakes on radical measures, including surgery that could leave young patients unable to have children of their own. We're going to bring you that story when we come back. Stay with us. There's been a staggering growth in gender medical treatment for children. In the United States alone, more than 50 pediatric clinics perform procedures, including surgery, that could leave young patients unable to have children of their own. Now, a surprising move by the American Academy of Pediatrics may be putting the brakes on such radical measures. The pushback is coming from parents and professionals, plus a significant shift in direction overseas. Heather Sells brings us the story. This latest pushback started in July when the United Kingdom closed its national clinic for kids. The shutdown came after an independent review found shaky scientific evidence for pushing hormones, puberty blockers and surgery. There's been a tendency here in the United States to dismiss that and in fact even to double down and, and be even more uh, uh, assertive uh, in saying that the affirmative approach uh, must be uh, used uh, here uh, in this country. U.S. hormone specialists like Dr. Paul Ruse are paying close attention. And now a class action lawsuit is launching against the clinic with as many as 1,000 affected families. I think this is going to be one of the uh, largest uh, medical negligence scandals of all time. Here in the U.S., social media protests over pediatric gender clinics have taken off prompting places like the Boston Children's Hospital to remove videos explaining its surgeries. And on Monday, the American Academy of Pediatrics appeared to backpedal, saying that for the vast majority of children, it does not recommend medical treatment or surgery. I do think that this is a shift. I think it's in response to the criticism that that's occurring. The recent growth in gender medicine is staggering. In the UK, young patients have grown from hundreds to thousands in the last decade. In the US, more than 50 pediatric clinics are in business since Boston opened the first in 2007. That the protocol has become uh, giving children as young as 9, 10, 11 puberty blockers. Attorney Mary Rice Hassan says many doctors put kids on a one-way treatment path that can lead to long-term harm. Advocates counter that such ages are appropriate. If we get kids early enough in the process, we put them on puberty blockers or medications that actually keep their body from progressing through that wrong puberty. Still, the latest research shows these kids will likely lose their ability to have children. Hassan argues they can't grasp the long-term effects of the treatments. They certainly can't consent to losing their fertility and their sexual function at an age when they haven't even experienced anything about that. How can they have a conception of that? Many parents are rising up by seeking help, becoming active in the cause, or both, after witnessing how gender medicine has harmed their children. Doctors are also speaking out, organizing to promote evidence-informed care. I certainly hope that the science can be elevated uh, to be on par uh, with other medical conditions that we treat. Doctors like Ruse propose deeper research to understand the best treatments for kids with gender distress and extreme caution 
in promoting these medical interventions to young patients and their parents. Heather Sells, CBN News. Still ahead, it sounds like something out of a novel about the end times, a way for the government to track your movements through a digital identity system. But it's not science fiction. It is under consideration right now in the European Union and might even come to the United States. We'll bring you the story right after this. Imagine a state where the government keeps tabs on everywhere you go, everything you say and everything you buy through a digital identity system. It sounds like communist China. Now the European Union may be headed in that same direction. And what's even worse, the idea is gaining support in the United States in our own Congress. Dale Hurt is on the story. Is the European Union on its way to becoming a surveillance society like China? The European Digital Identity. This cheery introduction to the EU's upcoming digital identity program tells citizens that it will make their lives easier while keeping them safer online. The European digital identity wallets will enable us to store and exchange documents and legal information while fully controlling which data we want to share with whom. ID data sent. EU President Ursula von der Leyen says digital identities will give citizens control over how their personal data is used and will help stop identity theft. The so-called digital wallet will be an app on a person's phone and will contain only the information a person wants it to include, such as medical or financial information. Credit rating sent. Income statement sent. It's already under attack in the European Parliament as something that would be ripe for government abuse. One of its chief critics, European Parliament member Christian Torres, was born in communist Romania and has long been warning of the EU's so-called Chinification. Clearly we are witnessing right now the Chinification of Europe because we see what is happening in China right now with the social credit score where the government is monitoring and uh, surveilling all the people from the beginning to end. Everything that they do, everything, everywhere where they walk, every, it's every, you know, they control everything and they, they, they watch everything. This is the example of a tyranny. The EU insists the digital identity program will be voluntary. Skeptics are wondering how long before it becomes mandatory. How voluntary is the European digital identity wallet? But even more important, how voluntary will it remain in the future? because the European Union always comes up with nice plans to eventually abuse it, to create more control. The EU's COVID passport was supposed to be temporary. Now Brussels wants to extend it until at least June of next year. COVID passports have been used to prevent the unvaccinated from crossing borders, entering grocery stores, using public transit and even going to their jobs. It's helped fuel violent demonstrations, the likes of which Europe hasn't seen for decades. Some in Washington are urging Joe Biden to establish digital identities for Americans as a way of fighting identity theft. There's also support in Congress. The so-called Improving Digital Identity Act of 2020 never made it to a vote, but could be revived. We asked an expert on digital identities if they are indeed a necessary safeguard against identity theft. The director of engineering at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Alexis Hancock, not only said no, but said digital IDs are more likely to encourage identity theft. I think this actually increases the attack vector. This makes you a bigger target in my eyes, especially if in a government issue digital identity. When you have something on the internet for a long time, the, there's an increased potential of it being breached in some fashion because of this long-term storage. And when you're able to associate something like that with a particular person, you can pivot from that long-term identifier to other information about them and compromise, say, your bank accounts or compromise some sort of information about you. Not only are digital IDs coming to Europe, but in Italy, the cities of Rome and Bologna have begun social credit programs that reward citizens for behavior that officials think will fight climate change, like using a bicycle instead of a car. A social credit system could be easily incorporated into a digital identity.
Austrian Catholic leader Alexander Chukowel says that in any European social credit system, Christians will lose because of their opposition to issues like abortion that the EU views as a human right. Therefore, I do not want the European Union to have the possibility to look into everything I do, everything I say, everything I have, and how I move and where I am at any time. Those systems are pushed by people who are highly anti-Christian. Torres warns that the EU's new digital ID is the next step in a process in which the government in Brussels will micromanage every aspect of people's lives. This is what makes the difference between a tyranny and democracy. When you know everything about what your government does, that's democracy. When the government knows everything about you, that is tyranny. Dale Hurd, CBN News. When we come back, we've got an encouraging word for your Thursday. Stay with us. Time now for your Thursday Thankful, and today I hope you'll join me in this prayer of gratitude. God, thank you for loving me, flaws and all. In fact, you don't even see them as flaws. As for this and for this, I am so grateful. There is no love like the love of an almighty Father. With this prayer of gratitude, I hope you will make this a thankful Thursday indeed. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Thank you so much for watching. I want to remind you that you can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time. You can also find them online, online at CBNNews.com. We'd love to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us again right back here next time. Make it a thankful Thursday. We look forward to seeing you right back here tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.